Hi there. Um, I have to confess, I have no sense of what time it is. I flew in yesterday from London. My body clock says it's around 4 a.m. I should be either dancing somewhere very drunk or I should be asleep. I don't understand why it's bright outside. I'm just really confused about what's going on. Um, so bear with me. If I kind of just phase out into the middle distance, it's not because of you guys. You're all great. It is, it is just because of my, my flights. Um, so that was like the posh introduction to me. That's the one that I kind of put on my CVs. Like, you know, I run a think tank at the London School of Economics. I can kind of, you know, I occasionally do government work of different sorts, not propaganda. Um, but, but that's really not who I am at all. I mean, I, I um, the reason that I'm here is because between 2000 and 2010, um, right after university, I went to Russia and I worked in TV production. I made entertainment shows, so I helped bring the reality show to Russia. I helped basically take all the horrible trash of our Western culture and use it to destroy the culture of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Uh, and it was a lot of fun working in Russia. I mean, I actually might as well mention this now. Um, so one of the shows that the company I worked for made, I didn't make it myself, was The Apprentice. They brought The Apprentice. Have you heard this show? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the political... Uh, no, no, no. You, we wish we hadn't, huh? Um, brought The Apprentice to Russia. And, um, and it was very interesting because you, know, you get Western producers over, like the guys who invented the format. The music was great. The show was made beautifully. They found an actual oligarch, not like your kind of like, you know, the guy you had here who's like, you know, kind of sort of pseudo businessman. They had a really famous, genuine businessman play the Donald Trump role. Everything was perfect. And the show completely flopped. Uh, and they realized it flopped because in Russia, um, this is not how you make money. You don't make money by being this kind of brilliant business mind who kind of like, you know, comes up with great ideas and sort of like, you know, these kind of challenges. You make money in Russia by shooting people, by being close to the government, by putting them in jail. And if, if you're kind of a genuine apprentice star in Russia, you get sent to the gulag, like Michael Hodorkovsky. Uh, other, other forms of reality show works very well in Russia, actually. Um, uh, like shows like Survivor, you know, when you take people and you dump them on an island and they have to survive. Russians love that. They're like, oh yeah, the gulag. We get it, yeah? Hardship survival, that was a runaway success. But anyway, so my first book was about, was about Russia and TV there. Um, and, and I was trying to analyze kind of a new type of political model, which I found very disconcerting. Um, and it was one where, kind of taking its main kind of constituent parts, where, you know, politicians didn't try to convince you of the truth anymore. They kind of reveled in the fact that they didn't care whether they were telling the truth. And the audiences didn't care whether they were lying. I mean, that's different, because usually, you know, even when politicians lie, you know, in Russia anyway, they used to try to sound very, very prim and proper and sound factual. Their lies were an attempt to uh, replace one reality with another. But here suddenly you had Putin and really starting from the 1990s, politicians like Vladimir Zhirinovsky sort of reveling in the fact that they were, total, they were talking utter poppycock. Um, and kind of it was also a political culture where there's no idea of the future anymore, where nostalgia dominated everything, where ideology was somehow very liquid, where social roles were constantly in flux, where the idea of the people was constantly being sort of created and recreated. And, uh, and where conspiracy theories had kind of replaced ideology as a way of explaining the world. And, and that was my, what, what, what my first book was about, and it was called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, where I try to kind of capture the essence of this new type of politics in one phrase. Uh, and, and at the end of the book, I come back to, to Britain in around sort of, you know, 2010, 11, 12. Um, it was a slow transition back. And, and uh, I come back at the end of the book very naively, kind of saying, oh, you know, the West is terrible in so many ways, but at least, you know, we live in a world where politicians are serious. And, and there's still ideologies, and there's still a coherent sense of political debate and discourse. And, and it's not just this endless game where no one cares about the truth anymore. And like a couple of years later, um, uh, you know, 2016 happens. Brexit in Britain, uh, Donald Trump here. Uh, 
And I just found myself looking around with this incredible sense of deja vu, um, going, oh my God, the Russia that I knew, or the political culture, I don't know, obviously Russia is a different country, but some of these sort of the undersoil of the political culture is now expressing itself in the West as well. And I talked to my Russian friends, they're like, oh my God, we ran away from Russia to get away from Putin. And now we see so many of the same pathologies in propaganda and public opinion manifest themselves here. And I was kind of trying to work out why that was that I decided to write my next book. That's what inspired me. I wanted to understand why had the future arrived first in Russia? Was it happening everywhere? And what do we do about it? And trying to answer that question took me on a journey around the world. The new book is not explicitly Russia-focused, uh, though Russia kind of stalks it. Um, and I went to the Philippines, to Mexico, to America, where I go anyway, all around Europe, uh, to China, trying to find what has changed, what, what's happened, why are we all suddenly living in this world where nothing is true and everything is possible. And then it ended up taking me also into, into the past, because in a way to understand what's going on in the present, uh, in the field of information, in the field of propaganda, which I'm saying here very, very broadly now is kind of just you know, the formation of public opinion. Um, it's worth understanding what has changed since, since the 20th century, since the Cold War. And uh, my book actually starts not in the present, but in the past, in the year 1976, where a man looking a little bit like myself went for a, a swim in the Black Sea uh, off the coast of the city of Odessa, which is in present-day Ukraine. He came out of the sea and was arrested on the beach. Two men in suits standing over his clothes as he returned from a swim. They ordered him to get dressed quickly, pull his trousers over his wet trunks. On the drive, the trunks were still wet, shrinking and turning cold, leaving a damp patch on his trousers in the back seat. He had to keep them on during the interrogation. There he was, trying to keep up a dignified facade, but the dank trunks made him squirm. It struck him. They had done it on purpose. They were well versed in this sort of thing. These mid-ranking KGB men, masters of the small-time humiliation, the micro-mind game. He had been detained for, for proliferating copies of harmful literature to friends and acquaintances, books censored for telling the truth about the Soviet gulag or for being written by exiles. When the colonel would leave, the major who was interrogating him would pull out a book of chess puzzles and work on them, chewing the end of a pencil. At first, their prisoner wondered if this was some clever mind game, then he realized the major was just killing time. After six days, he was permitted to go home to Kiev, but the investigation continued. While he was on the way home after work at the library, a black car pulled up and he was taken for more interrogations. During that time, life went on. His fiance conceived, they married at the back of the reception hall, lurked a KGB photographer. At dawn, he would rise gently, gently turn the spadola radio to on, push the dial to shortwave, wiggle and wave the antenna to dispel the fog of jamming, climbed on chairs and tables to get the best reception, steering the dial in an acoustic slalom between transitions, transmissions of East German pop and Soviet military bands, pressed his ear tight to the speaker, and through the hiss and crackle, made his way to the magical world. Words, this is London, this is Washington. He was listening for news about arrests broadcast on Western radio stations. The net closed around his circle. Grisha was taken to the woods and roughed up. Olga was accused of being a prostitute and locked up in a VD clinic with actual prostitutes to make the point. Geli was taken to Raman prison and refused treatment for so long that he died. Everyone prepared for the worst. His mother-in-law taught him a secret code based on sausages. If I bring sausages sliced right to left, it means we've been able to get out news of your arrest to the West and it's been broadcast on the radio. If I slice them to the right, it means we failed. It sounds like something out of an old joke or a bad film, but it's nevertheless true, he would write later. When the KGB comes at dawn and you mumble drowsily, who's there? They often shout, telegram. You proceed in semi-sleep, trying, trying not to wake up too much so you can still go back to a snug dream. One moment, you moan, put on the nearest trousers, Dig out some change to pay the messenger, open the door, 
And the most painful part is not that they have come for you, or that they've got you up so early, but that you, like some small boy, fell for the lie about a telegram. You squeeze in your hot palm the suddenly sweaty change, holding back tears of humiliation. At 8 a.m. on September the 30th, 1977, in between interrogations, their child was born. My grandmother wanted me to be called Pinhas after her grandfather. My parents wanted Theodore. I ended up being named Piotr, one of the first of several renegotiations of my name. 40 years have passed since my parents were pursued by the KGB over the simple right to read, write, and listen to what they chose and say what they wanted. Today, the world they hoped for, where censorship would fall like the Berlin Wall, can seem much closer. We, leave and we live in what some academics call an era of information abundance. But the assumptions that underlay the struggles for rights and freedoms in the 20th century, between citizens armed with truth and information and regimes with their censors and secret police have been turned upside down. We now have more information than ever before, but it hasn't brought only the benefits we expected. More information was, but was supposed to mean more freedom to stand up to the powerful, but it also has given the powerful new ways to crush and silence dissent. More information was supposed to mean a more informed debate, but we seem less capable of deliberation than ever. More information was supposed to mean mutual understanding across borders, but has also made possible new and more subtle forms of conflict and subversion. We live in a world of influence operations run amok, where the means of manipulation have gone forth and multiplied. So excuse the long reading there. I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of the book because from now on, I'll talk, to, I'll talk in ways which are a little bit more abstract. But it, it is a book of, of stories. It is a book of my parents' story and of the stories of people today who try to fight the new ways of manipulation. But it's also a book where I try to understand what's the difference between the Cold War uh, and, and the war today, the propaganda wars of the Cold War and the ones today. And the first one that's changed, I suppose, is, is, is a very simple one. That's a, a technological one. So my father... Uh, and dissidents like him uh, were fighting against censorship. Yeah? They were fighting uh, uh, against a system where books weren't allowed to be published, where they had to listen to uh, foreign radio stations through a fog of jamming. Um, today, that's, that's not really the case anymore. Um, and you th would think that that would mean that uh, you know, those who advocate for democracy will have won, but instead the powerful have found new ways of, kind of, of abusing, essentially, the, uh, the principles of freedom of expression. Uh, and my book, you know, the first stories that I look at in the book are all about this, how um, authoritarian forces or neo-authoritarian forces or just, you know, democratic forces, but those that are against any kind of genuine, deliberative, common debate have learned to flood the internet especially uh, with so much disinformation that people can't tell the difference between what is true and false anymore. And even more so, I, I travel to Manila, to the Philippines in the book, and I follow the story of journalists and opposition politicians to the current president, uh, who's a proto-Trumpian figure called Duterte. Uh, and, you know, the Philippines in the Cold War uh, had its own secret police uh, who would oppress people very much like the KGB did. Today, it's very, very different. Today, opposition uh, voices are attacked with armies of cyber, cyber militias and trolls uh, who are most probably connected to the government, but it's incredibly hard to prove that they are. And when uh, you know, opposition people and journalists say, you know, try to protest against this, then the government turns around and says, you always wanted freedom of expression, well, here you are. You know, these are concerned citizens uh, attacking you. What can we do about it? And it's as if the ground has been taken away from, uh, from, from, from the democratic opposition. They don't have these arguments anymore. Um, and something else very interesting, I think, has changed with the, uh, uh, with the, with the introduction of, of the internet into this game, uh, which has got to do with freedom of expression. Um, so my father was a writer when he was arrested, uh, and he wrote very purposefully uh, in this very kind of impressionistic uh, prose, this sort of like this sort of orgy of self-expression, which was deeply tied to, you know, democratic ideals, you know, uh, sort of uh, autocratic regimes crushed 
the individual. And so the rebellious thing was to listen to jazz or to, in my father's case, try to imitate Reading Faulkner. His first novella was called Reading Faulkner, where he tries to kind of imitate his hero. In his first novella, Reading Faulkner, written when he was 27, Igor, that's my dad's name, played on motifs from his own life when his fictional narrator, a young writer, discovers his fictional father's impersonal official writing and compares it with his own. So this is sort of the, the language that, you know, of, of the Soviet Union that's, that's uh, uh, that he's trying to reject. This country has thrown off the chains of capitalist slavery. Bourgeois culture was always far from the people. Now it has revealed its true face, the face of the maidservant of the monopolistic capital. Welcome the socialist son. Let the darkness be gone. And my father would write things like, just a minute ago, you were walking down the street, breathing in air and breathing out words. Now you have burst through to the page. Now it will pour out like wild berries you've been carrying inside your jacket. Is there any joy greater than writing in the first person? So in the 70s, for my father, this was, this was a revolutionary way of writing. It was a celebration of freedom in an authoritarian country. Today, you can express yourself all you want on social media. You can go on Facebook or go on V Contacti in Russia and pour out your soul. The whole you know, social media model is based around this. But instead of empowering you, the more of yourself you leave on social media, the more um, governments or the other propagandistic forces can analyze you and find targeted messages in order to manipulate you. And that's a massive change, again, to the association of freedom of expression and political empowerment. The more you speak in a weird way, the more manipulable, manipulatable, the more manipulatable you are. <laughs> oh, yeah, jet lag, jet lag. Um, and you know, like one of the first countries to grasp this was actually Putin's, Putin's Russia. There's a great study from 2010 by Citizen Lab, who are a Canadian academic group, and, and, and they started going, oh, we see something very weird happening on the Russian internet. They're not trying to censor people. They're just trying to flood the zone with disinformation and with very, very targeted messaging because they know exactly which audiences they're going for. But that's kind of the technical thing. And I'm not a technological determinist. I think, I think there's something else that has changed from, from the 20th century. Uh, so for my father, you know, he was a, a you know, Soviet dissident uh, fighting the Soviet Union, but he saw himself connected with other kind of uh, freedom movements throughout the world. I mean, he was greatly inspired by, um, by, by, by the Prague Spring, the 1968 uh, rebellion in, the, in Czechoslovakia against Soviet rule. Um, and, you know, in 1989, you know, these civic groups rise up and you have this, you know, this incredible scene of across the world, not just in Eastern Europe, in South America and South Africa and South Asia, of people marching through the streets of people power overturning authoritarian rule. And I look at, the, you know, there, there's a very, that's a very, very powerful story to tell. There's kind of this, this, this association of people out on the streets and an idea of history, that democracy will, will win out, that uh, democratization is inevitable, you know, what Obama talks about, the right arc of history. And uh, in the book, I, I, I talk to a lot of people who lead these kind of like, these bottom-up movements. And one of the guys I talk to is uh, Sergei Popovich, who was one of the uh, leaders of the revolution against Milosevic in 1999 in Yugoslavia, and has really become a guru of non-violent, people-powered revolutions. Uh, he trains activists across the world, uh, in Eastern Europe before the color revolutions, um, in the Middle East before the Arab Spring. Um, and when I met him in Belgrade, because he's, he's Serb, he was finding, you know, he was in this very, very strange moment where all the stories that he told, all the practices that he'd taught people were being co-opted by the other side um, in various ways. The Russian government and other authoritarian regimes were organizing kind of their own forms of people-powered protest. In Estonia in 2006 to 2007, Russia was already using a, a mix of uh, uh, sort of like uh, um, social media attacks, propaganda attacks, and sort of igniting street protests. But this time, not in support of democracy, but, in, but the opposite, in, uh, in support of kind of authoritarian regimes. Um, in Ukraine in 2015, after the great revolution of dignity in Kiev, again, the Kremlin and proxy forces organized kind of parody protests in East Ukraine. They even call it the Russian Spring to echo the Prague Spring of 68. 
And it was as if they were taking the language of people-powered protests and kind of saying, actually, there is no inevitable association between you know, protests out in the streets, civic movements, and democracy. They can mean their opposite. They're kind of parodying the whole language of people protests and through that making it null and void. Um, there are other ways that the work of, um, you know, that great storytelling of, of protest movements was breaking down. Um, the first thing that Sirja uh, tells protest movements is that you have to develop an idea of the future that's different to the regimes. That was very easy with the Soviet Union, with Milosevic. They were authoritarian. The protest leaders were freedom-loving. Um, they had terrible state-sponsored arts, while these guys had jazz or rock music. But that's completely changed now. So a much cleverer type of authoritarian regime, whether in Russia, whether in Serbia, whether in China, has learned not to hold on to one ideology. They don't create, they don't allow themselves to be one thing that can't be, uh, that can be opposed. They, uh, you, know, um, you know, the Putin regime can be nationalist one moment and then incredibly globalist the next. Uh, it can celebrate Russian imperialism and then its own multiculturalism. It's constantly moving about and constantly transforming. It's co-opted the cultural language of the West. Uh, reality shows, like, as I was helping them do, I suppose. Uh, and rock music and rap. So you can't really oppose them as you could easily before. And instead of having one ideology that you could build a protest movement against, they use conspiracy. And that's what really unites uh, the Putin approach, the Chinese approach, and, and I suppose Trump as well. Conspiracies have sort of become, they've replaced ideology. They're not conspiracies that buttress you know, an idea of history. You know, the communists and the Nazis obviously indulged in conspiracy theories, but they were there to support a bigger theory, one about class warfare or about anti-Semitism. Now, you know, the propagandists of these regimes just, they kind of, they, they, they create conspiracy and conspiracy and conspiracy, the aim of which is to give the audience and the public the sense that the truth is unknowable, that you'll never get to the truth, and very subtly communicate the message that Look, if you can't get to the truth, if you live in a world of endless hidden hands where everyone is always manipulating everyone else, you can't change anything. So your struggles, your protests, they're pointless. And at the same time, as this kind of story that was so kind of implicit in what uh, uh, the freedom fighters of the 20th century were striving for, this association of people out on the streets of a certain type of music with a certain type of progress has been sort of eaten away at an even more fundamental level. This is probably the most important thing that I kind of discovered in the writing of, of, of my book. In the 20th century, there was, at the end of the day, a competition between two versions of a future-oriented history. Um, two enlightenment projects, essentially. The, uh, the communist one was built in its own weird way on supposedly scientific socialist principles. Democratic capitalism was, was imbued with, a, with an enlightenment logic. And for both of those, facts were incredibly important in order to prove that you were getting somewhere, that you were achieving this future that you'd promise. So when my father would sort of sit there, you know, listening for, for reports from the West, there was a real value to finding out the truth. The communists were actually petrified of the truth coming out. I mean, you've all seen the Chernobyl series, you know, uh, uh, and how, uh, you know, how, how they felt truth could undermine them because they were trying to create their own alter alternative, alternative truth, but was meant to feel factual. Um, it's very interesting going back and looking at the way the Soviet regime would react when it was caught out lying by, by, by the West. I mean, there was a kind of a, a propaganda campaign that the Soviets did in the 20th century, in 1980 actually, trying to, you know, trying to show that the CIA developed AIDS as a weapon against the Afro-American population. And when Reagan called Gorbachev out on this, Gorbachev was appalled, like, how dare you say the Soviet Union is lying? Today, when Putin sort of says to the whole world, um, there are no Russian soldiers in Crimea. When everyone knows there are and kind of smirks. And a couple of weeks later goes, well, you know, actually there were and rewards everybody there with medals. He's not lying. He's saying, I don't care about facts. I don't care about the truth. 
And your current president seems to almost revel in this kind of anarchic liberation from, from glum reality. And what's really changed is that at one point in the 21st century, the value and the coherence of any idea of the future fell away for a lot of people. So in Russia, I think this happened earlier. In Russia, this happened in 1989 when communism was discredited or even earlier. And then by 93, the idea of democratic reforms leading to a, a rational future collapsed, essentially, with the, uh, you know, with, with, with disastrous, with a disastrous period, uh, which brought much death and, and misery. In the West, I think this happened later, probably after 2008, the Great Crash, we could point to the war in Iraq as, as a undermining of the idea that democracy was inevitable. I mean, I think there's lots of different moments, but enough of, the, of an idea of the future falls away. And uh, if there's no idea of the future anymore, then, then why would you need facts? I mean, facts are not particularly pleasant. I mean, they tell me that I'm jet lagged, that, uh, you know, that one might be overweight. At the end of the day, facts tell you you're gonna die. They're just useful if you're trying to prove something. But if there's no, you're not trying to prove any coherent idea of the future, which is where we've all arrived to now, um, then why would facts be necessary? And instead, you kind of celebrate the politician, whether a Putin or a Trump, who celebrates the release from facts, the sort of almost libidinal energy that's, that's released there. And Russia simply arrived at this place that we are in now much, much earlier. So already in the 1990s, Russian propagandists and Russian politicians are thinking about how do they create a new type of politics which can negotiate this new unreality. And that's why I think the Russians, that's why I feel that, uh, you know, I'd seen something in Russia in the late 90s and early 2000s and see it now arise here. And I think that's why Russia has become very good at playing the propaganda games of the 21st century. It's a waning power that has managed to put itself on the cover of every magazine uh, and, and has played sort of these new fluctuating lines very, very well. I don't think there's anything mystical about the fact that the future arrived first in Russia. Um, it, just, um, it just got there first. Actually, paradoxically, by losing the Cold War, it managed to arrive uh, at, our current, at our current state much earlier. And in the book, there's really one kind of interview that really brings this out for me, where I interview uh, a guy called Gleb Pavlovsky, who was a Russian spin doctor uh, with a very interesting personal story, who, who managed Yeltsin's campaigns in 96, uh, and then Putin's campaigns in 1999. So one of the guys who kind of created the politics that I, that I saw when I, when I lived there. I first invented the idea of the Putin majority. One of the first spin doctors, Gleb Pavlovsky, told me when I still lived in Moscow. And then it appeared. The communist ideocracy was sluggish, but it was an ideological entity nonetheless, he said, gently advising me to ask more precise questions. Even up to the end, people could at least argue over the positives and negatives of communism. Now, now he's talking about his own career in the 90s, a vacuum arose requiring a new language. We were an absolutely blank canvas. We had, in a sense, to reinvent the principles of the political system as best as possible. The vision of a pretty future of freedom had fallen apart in the devastations of the early 1990s. Instead, the landscape was dotted with new micro-movements making up their own terminology as they went along. National Bolsheviks, liberal Democrats who are actually conspiratorial nationalists, communists who were orthodox monarchists with social programs. When he polled the country, Pavlovsky found Russians believed in contradictions that didn't fit into any old conceptions of left and right. Most believe in a strong state, as long as it didn't involve itself in their personal lives. Soviet demographic categories like workers, collective farmers, intelligentsia were useless to win elections. Pavlovsky experimented with a different approach to assembling an electorate. Instead of focusing on ideological argument, he targeted different, often conflicting, social groups and began to collect them like a Russian doll. It didn't matter what their opinions were, he just needed to gather enough of them. You collect them for a short period, he told me, literally for a moment, but so they all vote together for one person. To do this, you need to build a fairy tale that would be common to all of them. 
That fairy tale couldn't be a political ideology. The great ideas that had powered collective notion of progress were dead. The disparate groups needed to be uni unified around a central emotion, a feeling powerful enough to unite them, yet vague enough to mean anything to anyone. And then I'll go to sort of what he did in 19, 1999. Sorry, let me just... For the 2000 presidential election, Pavlovsky pulled together everyone who felt they had lost out during the Yeltsin years, what he calls the left behind, and imbued them with a the sense that this was their last chance to be winners. These were disparate segments of society that in Soviet times would have been on different sides of the barricades, teachers, secret service types, academics, soldiers, whom Pavlovsky would bundle together under the idea of the Putin majority. When Pavlovsky looks at the West today, he sees it going through the same changes Russia underwent in the 1990s, a delayed reaction to a similar crisis. As he told me, the Cold War splits global civilization into two alternative forms, both of which promised people a better future. He told me when I interviewed him, the Soviet Union undoubtedly lost, but then there appeared a strange Western utopia with no alternative. This utopia was ruled over by economic technocrats who could do no wrong, then that collapse. In this identity and ideological flux, political campaigners in the West have ended up adopting strategies strikingly similar to, P to Pavlovsky's, though enhanced by social media and big data. So in the book, I talk a little bit about the Trump election, which was modeled in very, very similar ways. And, and of course, Brexit, uh, which, you know, really was kind of a post echo of Pavlovsky's tactics in the 90s, 90s. Um, I think we look at the idea of populism in, in, in the wrong way, actually. Um, populism, the way spin doctors talk about it, is, is a strategy. It's a way of creating political campaigns in a post-ideological time and in a time when the old social categories have broken down. And I interviewed the, uh, um, the digital head of the campaign that won the Brexit referendum. And it was incredible how, how much he'd kind of, he hadn't heard about Pavlovsky. He discovered the same recipes for success because weirdly the culture had become quite similar. Um, there again, th there was no one ideology to Brexit. That wouldn't have won it. Um, quite the opposite. Um, he had to do a social media segmentation, find completely different audiences motivated by completely different things. Some were, um, some were motivated by immigration. That's the easy ones, you know, the, the nationalists, fine. But that's only 15% of your vote. You've got to get everyone else. The most successful campaign he did, people who really care about animal rights. He managed to do targeted online campaigns during the Brexit referendum saying the EU is horrible towards animals because it sponsors bullfighting. And that was his most successful ad to get people out to vote. There is nothing in common between white nationalists in England and people who like animals. These are different segments. But he managed to unite them all around this vague idea of taking back control, which can mean anything to anyone, and with a vague enemy, the EU, which was the source of everybody's ills. It's very similar when you look at the Trump campaign, where part of the appeal was white nationalists, but it was also you know, housewives in New Jersey who were targeted with a completely different set of messaging. And obviously there's a lot of crossover between the Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign in terms of the spin doctors involved, in terms of the companies involved who kind of drove this approach. Um, so I think all this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, all these kind of conflicts kind of crystallized in one, in one thing. Um, and that's, this strange term that I now hear a lot in the US as well, information warfare, which worries me a lot. I'll explain to you why. So information warfare, which is a big part of the current thinking of the Russian government, is not merely a collection of kind of, you know, social media tricks um, to interfere with other people's democracies. It's kind of a worldview that's replaced the Cold War and it's replaced ideology. And essentially, it's a worldview that says there is no idea of history. There is no idea of the future. There are no real ideas or ideologies. There is just endless manipulation. And what we think of as historical processes are just accidents of competing manipulative forces. So it, this started off, actually, among kind of philosophers connected to the security services in Russia in the 1990s and early 2000s. And they started to talk about the end of the Cold War 
not the way my father or, or most of you probably think about it as, as a battle of values, of uh, democracy against authoritarianism. They thought about it in a very different way, that actually the West had planted information viruses in the Soviet Union, like perestroika and glasnost, and freedom of expression. But these were just, you know, these were just you know, masks for the real aim of overturning Russia. And they saw the whole of history, the Arab Spring, um, Yugoslavia, not as a battle of ideas, but as a battle of uh, information warfare. Now, I'd say first the Kremlin kind of ignored these people, but as the Kremlin needed its own excuses to explain away very big mass protests in Russia, uh, the revolution in Ukraine, they adopted this information warfare language. Uh, and they now explain what goes on in the world as, as information warfare. It's a deeply conspiracist worldview. Now, one of the consequences of, of Russia's now very well-documented social media operations in the US election is that I see this information warfare language being, being echoed here. Uh, I did a quick test on the MIT Word Tools uh, word tools tool that um, uh, allows you to measure how different words are being used in the media here. And I think the term information warfare went up by 300% after 2016. And that's a very, very worrying development for me because by framing what's going on in the world as information warfare, we start to look at it just like the Russians do and just like the Chinese do. And that puts us in a situation where we start to be very paranoid of the information around us. But Fine, that's, that we can get over, but it starts to put in place policies which are just the ones that Russia wants. It's happening in Europe now. Essentially, they're forms of censorship. There's a new German law and a new French law basically saying that we have to censor the internet, partly as a consequence of the Russian operations. So this is the classic mistake that we make when we try to think about how to grapple with all the issues that I've been talking about. We start to repeat the language of the aggressor, and then to impose the policies that he wants. Because there's nothing, you know, there's, there's nothing more that Russia and the Kremlin would want than having an excuse to impose censorship themselves. They even have an idea of information sovereignty, where essentially the great victories of the Cold War of 1989, of the things people like my father fought for, are washed back again. So that, I hope, sort of very elegantly gets me onto the question of solutions, because I do, I do broach the question of solutions in the book. And I'll, I'll go through them very quickly, because really I want your feedback as well, because I'm lying if I think I know how to solve all of this. But um, I've created a think tank at the LSE to think about it. Uh, so uh, I should probably say something. I do think regulation can play a role, but I think it has to be very, very clever. I think if we look at what's actually wrong with the Russian campaigns, both domestically, the campaigns that I talked about in the Philippines, yeah, with these cyber militias, and also abroad to, to damage America's precious and, it turns out, very fragile democracy. Um, the problem isn't content so much as behavior. It's deceptive behavior. It's that we don't understand that a campaign is organic or if it's artificial online. That if something is a bot or a real person. That's the problem that, you know, the people in the Philippines face who are fighting Duterte and what journalists and analysts face here and trying to understand how the information environment around us is being shaped. We kind of live in a world where we don't understand how the information weather is created. And so I do think regulation plays a role and I think it has to be about transparency. I think we have to understand, be able to see how the information environment is created. I think that will also mean public oversight of algorithms so they stop being a black box. It also means more transparency and accountability for the material that the companies tech companies take down. It has to be a completely different field. And that's the sort of regulation that I think all democracies can get behind. And that's still very much in the spirit of 1989 and of democratic logic, which was always to demand more information. We're not asking for censorship, we're asking for more information about the information environment. And that's the sort of regulatory logic that uh, you know, governments like Duterte's or Putin's or Xi Jinping's loathe, because they need to keep their own populations in the dark. But that's the role of regulation, which, which is always going to be small in the information space. Um, much more important is how to compete in this, in, in this world. Um, and I think there's one thing that I found as I went around the world. There is no ideological consistency to all these different political campaigns. But they do kind of have one aim, and that's polarization. 
Yeah, they, need, they mean to strengthen polarization, to set people against each other, and to break down that kind of deliberative space in which democracy is enacted. And I think we're gonna need some sort of actor that goes, that gets up in the morning, every morning, and thinks about how do they bring different groups together. If the propaganda today is targeted with different messages of different groups, each of them becoming more and more calcified in their little fragmented echo chambers, which is a bad term because they're not really echo chambers, but okay, let's call them that. Then it has to be someone's job in the morning to get up and to bring them together. So we're doing a lot of experimental projects like that at the LSE. In a way, we're using the same analytical tools as the Russians or the guys who created Brexit. We're also trying to understand audiences, trying to understand what motivates them, but we're doing it in a transparent way. And then we're creating content that hopes to generate a common discussion between them. I don't think media can do this because sadly media have ended up playing into the polarization. Public service media is too slow and a little bit too clunky to, to deal with it, even though it has the right ethos. So I think we're gonna have to need a, a new type of civic actor to deal with this. And what kind of discussion do we want to generate yeah, as we try to create this new, this new public sphere? As I try to sort of bring home in my, in my very brief overview of the book, what's gone missing is a discussion about the future. We have to learn how to foster and generate that discussion. Like I'm not a huge political philosopher, but I am a recovering journalist. And there's a way for us to cover politics that doesn't play into the polarization, that doesn't play into a politics of performance where, you know, facts really don't matter anyway. You know, you're, you're approaching an election here and you're making the same mistakes as you did in the last one. It's depressing to watch. We're about to have an election in the UK and we're doing it again there. We have to get away from the reality show elements of how we conduct journalism. When we have to chain and foster discussions which force politicians to talk about practical, bush, practical policies that they wish to enact in the future and then find ways to track those promises and to hold them to account. That's a very different way of conducting journalism. But those are kind of the, the sort of the boring things that I have to deal with in my everyday life. What I'm really interested, I suppose, is how can the arts and creative nonfiction, which is what I'm really interested in when I'm not working, um, react to this situation? So, you know, my father is a leitmotif in this book. I sort of follow his personal journey throughout the book as I contrast it with all the propaganda out there. And the reason I do that is not because, you know, I'm you know, that much of a fan of my dad, like every other son, it's a difficult relationship. But because he, he was a writer and an artist and, and what he was always doing in the 70s, and the 80s, the 90s, and he's alive at the end of the book and flourishing, uh, is trying to reinvent language even as the propagandists are eating language up. You know, even as I, language about human rights, about democracy, the great stories we told ourselves around pro protest movements fall apart and most importantly, as the idea of self-expression becomes pretty much debased. You know, he's always trying to reinvent the way he writes in order to stay ahead and be able to encounter reality with a new language. And this book actually is a very small and pitiful attempt to do that in, in narrative nonfiction. Uh, and in a couple of ways. Firstly, I do think it's going to be hard to us to, to return to kind of objective notions of talking about reality, that kind of big history and big narratives, they're, they're probably gone. But what I think we can do as, as, as writers is, is trying to you know, disclose all our biases, you know, present a subjectivity which makes a dialogue with a reader and with another author possible. Um, and I come to, back to that over and over in the book. It's a slightly postmodern book where I'm constantly thinking about the situation I'm doing an interview with, and I show how the interview is made. And I show the, you know, the way we create a reality and a narrative. But by opening that up, I'm not trying to say there is no reality, it's quite the opposite. I'm hoping to invite the reader and, and other authors in, into a dialogue where we can have that genuine interaction, which has gone missing. And the other way I try to do it is, it's very hard to live uh, to write about reality at, at a time when all the forms of narrative have really been taken up by various forms of, of manipulation and, and influence. So, so, you know, even something as personal as the diary now is, is now, uh, you know, misused uh, as a way to manipulate you if you, write it, if you write it online. So I think what I try to do in the book is collide different genres. There are bits of the book which are family memoir and a sort of narrative. There are bits which are academic studies. 
there are bits which are uh, 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 th there are bits which are kind of just like you know critical analysis of media, and by colliding these different genres, I'm hoping that reality kind of appears uh, in the bits between them. Um, you will have to tell me whether it worked, but it's a very conscious experiment, um, and I'll probably end there because I have to give you a time to ask me questions, because I keep on talking about the need for engagement and deliberation, and I'm completely dominating things in this really authoritarian way. I hope that made sense. You're my guinea pigs. This is the first time I've talked about the book in a public setting in this kind of sustained way. Um, so also feedback, how do I do this better in San Francisco in two days time? Because <laughs> everyone knows Seattle is where the clever people live. Um, yeah. Your story about um, how they manipulated people with bullfighting in Europe is fascinating. And the left tends to be very fond of purity tests, that you have to believe everything we're talking about, not just some of it. And recently in the United States, the Mooch, Anthony Scaramucci, who served for 10 days in the Trump administration, started attacking Trump. And people were saying, well, why did it take you so long? So the question I want to ask you is, if we have to get more sophisticated at tailoring our arguments to a broader audience, how do we resist this idea of purity tests to be able to enlarge the tent? Wow, that's almost like a religious question, isn't it? Uh, should I take several questions or, or one by one? What's, what's the format here? One, wow, that's different. In Britain, we're allowed to take several and then ignore the tough ones. Damn, this is a real democracy. Um, <laughs> purity tests. Yeah. Um, I'm more interested in voices which are kind of faulted. You know, my book is full of faulty voices. Um, Gleb Pavlovsky, the guy who, I, who created, helped create Putin, was actually a dissident in the 70s, but he was broken. And really his story might be the story of somebody who was broken by the KGB in the 70s and has ended up having this warped relationship with the Kremlin ever since. But that makes him fascinating. Um, you know, I'm not, purity is something that one, one expects from saints and saintly leaders. It's horrible. I would be very suspicious of anybody pure. I definitely want the mooch. I'd rather have the mooch than it. Purity scares me. Um, so I, I don't know. I think America is a little bit special. Uh, it's one of those lovely euphemisms. Um, and the cliche, and you tell me if it's true, the cliche has always been, it's because it's such a young country. It's kind of young, young old now. Uh, it's not that, you know, there's, there's younger countries on the block, but it's um, still a young country where people didn't have much history, so therefore identity and, and your kind of political identity became sacrosanct because that really was who you could explain you were. Um, I, I wonder whether that, that can be problematic as well. Um, look, it's, 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 democracy works when you have messy discourse. What's happened now is that, you know, we're all kind of screaming from our little uh, echo pulpits to ourselves. Um, you know, there, there's a whole theory in philosophy that sort of truth and reality emerges in discourse. You know, in terms of I have the truth, no, I have the truth. It actually emerges in the moment of communication um, and when different realities collide. Um, there's some linguistic theories about that as well, but, but fine. So, so yeah, I, I would, I'd take the mooch over the purists, actually. Um, but yeah. I'm not sure purity is going to help us here. Values are. Values are really important. Cynicism is, is, is destructive. But uh, I don't know, purity. Then they always end up, isn't that kind of like, you know, it's like that guy who's doing conversion therapy and just turned out he was gay. When I hear purity, I just, I just feel that. Okay, what's, what's going on here? You know. I have a question. Oh, wow, it's like two sides. God. Oh. <laughs> They're on the left and I'm on the right. Right, right, right. And I'm trying to create dialogue. You know. Anyway, I just wanted to ask, uh, what does history teach us about how other civilizations and other cultures and time have effectively dealt with these situations? Yeah. So, so history teaches us that when, I'm not a technological determinant, determinist, but I do think, I do think media do, does recreate our, our reality to a great extent. So history teaches us that when a new, there's a media revolution, like the print revolution, or the radio revolution, or the TV revolution, the first people who seize hold of it um, in a 
really potent way are, are the forces of anger, viciousness, and destruction. So the print revolution before it you know, gives birth to the Enlightenment, you know, sort of helps catalyze the wars of religion, 30 years of warfare in Europe. Radio is really first seized upon by totalitarian dictatorships. TV's first great genius is, is Senator McCarthy. So um, history teaches a lot of bad things, and then it takes a while for, I'm gonna use this absolutist language now, the forces of good, to, to get their heads around how to use this, uh, how to mitigate those damages. And history teaches us that um, it can get incredibly, incredibly, incredibly messy, and let's just hope that it doesn't this time. Um, so the history's, the, the experience of history is, is pretty negative. And I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I work at a school that has a lot of, uh, a large Eastern European population, and it's actually interesting how many of those kids are steeped in conspiracy theories and you know they watch Alex Jones and they are convinced that everything they see on mainstream media is a liberal conspiracy. And what is the best way to reach them without buying into their, their already beliefs that everything that goes against their opinion is some left-wing conspiracy to kind of change their mind, to kind of see that the world's more complex than their conspiracy theory outlooks? So that, that's such an interesting question. That's one of the things that, that we really want to research uh, at, at ARENA, which is a think tank I run at the LSE. Um, I think we have to understand, we do have to understand their motivations much more. I think you'll find that a certain percentage are kind of lost, um, while others are just super curious. Uh, while others, you know, especially coming from Eastern Europe, where you are legitimately allowed not to trust the media, have kind of taken those cultural precepts and moved them here. So you, you could find completely different ways of working those. I think you'd have to break apart that, that bundle, stop thinking about them as one homogenous clump, uh, and start work, you know, build, building dialogue with each one's, which each one separately. I think it's very interesting looking at the motivation for regimes like Russia's, like Vucic's in Serbia, and, and, now, and now yours here, to make conspiracy their main, their main idiom, really. Um, I mentioned it in, 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 in my little ramble of a talk, but, but I think the aim is to give people the sense that they can't change anything. You know, Sean Hannity, who's you know, a very familiar person to anybody Russian, um, <laughs> gives this kind of, you know, this conspiracist fugues. I mean, they're quite beautiful, actually, in a way. I mean, I had to watch a lot of Fox News for my work, so I kind of forced myself to enjoy it. Um, and, and, he, and, and at the end, it's like, and only Trump, only a strong man can lead us through this dark, dark world. I mean, that's the point. You have no agency, you need a Trump. Only Putin can take Russia off its knees. Very interesting, Russian TV doesn't, these days, it doesn't show this beautiful, successful Russia. It shows a Russia beset by evil conspiracies and crime, because that gives you the sense, oh, we need a strong hand and Putin's strong hand to, to guide us. So actually, the real cure for that, I think, is imba imbuing people with the sense that they have agency, yeah? that they can change anything. So again, I think you have to deal with the effects of the, cons of the conspiracy propaganda when it's used for that very you know, specific reason and deal with the effects of it. You can't really deal with the content. It's so hard to do that. You know, once somebody's got into their heads that, uh, um, you know, that PBS is run by the lizard people, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Left uh, and right doesn't really exist anymore, so this is very chaotic, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> Just populism. Yeah, thank you uh, for your talk. Um, I've seen some people propose using education, especially starting young in, in primary and uh, high school, of teaching people how to engage with media, how to mm. tell apart conspiracy websites from mm. legitimate media and fight against propaganda. So what's your take on that idea? Mm. And um, that that uh, specific technique, or more broadly, is there any country that you know that is doing a good job against fighting against propaganda? So, so, th so yeah, so media literacy is kind of the default thing that, it's, that liberal governments like to do because it's safe. It's just like, yay, we'll do some you know, like civics classes. I think, look, education about critical thinking is part of civics, is part of what we have to have in schools. It, it won't cure this. Um, a, there's a certain arrogance in thinking, oh, they're just stupid. 
uh, when test after test after mm. test shows that even very bright people uh, indulge in confirmation bias, that we will seek out the information we want. Um, I've seen many of my liberal American friends just post nonsense after nonsense about Trump, which just wasn't true. Um, and there's a whole ecology on social media which is set up to feed this now, uh, which is just as, I wouldn't say just as cynical as the right as, as the pro-Trump one, but it's, it's pretty damn cynical as well. People who do this know what they're doing. So, so, so sadly, I don't think that works, but even more fundamentally, here's the danger with it. So authoritarian regimes now love media literacy because their aim isn't trying to convince you that the Kremlin is you know, creating utopia. Their aim is to convince you not to trust anything. Yeah? And weirdly, media literacy can be used to do that. Don't trust anything. You know? Actually, what we need is communication and being able to have constructive arguments again. That's what we need. So I'd like us to train that. Maybe that's something that we can train up and, and you know, try to imbue people with a sense of, of, of discourse with the other side and, and discursive practices. But just going around being a bit paranoid, I mean, the best, you know who the best deconstructor of media is out there? Sean Hannity. He's brilliant. He will, again, I have to watch a lot of this stuff. He will take apart every little bit in NBC and CBS over the last 10 years with precision. He's got great researchers. All his arguments, by the way, are right. He'll do numbers, quite accurate numbers about, oh, look how, you know, how little they criticized Obama and how much Trump, you know, all good. At the end, he doesn't say, therefore, we need better, more objective media. There, at the end, he says, objective media doesn't exist. Only subjectivity exists. Only emotion exists. And it's Trump against the, what's that wonderful phrase of his? The defeat Trump all left Soros conspiracy media monster or something like that. <laughs> so, so the, but listen, we know this, you know, you know, it's always like the really skeptical people who end up believing crazy stuff. Yeah, it's just like, you know, the people who don't trust anything who end up on Infowars. So, so there's a dark side to media literacy. And, and oddly, one needs a little bit of trust in order to have a conversation with someone. Um, it's the right sort of trust. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not bad trust. But, but um, I, 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 don't, I, I think media literacy is, is, is just, I think it's important. It's part of our education, but we've misdiagnosed the problems if, if we think it's just people being stupid. Before my, I pose my question, perhaps a bit of kudos for you. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. I think that uh, it was at the same time a bit disheartening and also stimulating to think about uh, what the topic of this evening's presentation was. And I sincerely hope uh, you will not mind the jet lag and come to Seattle again. I have made my 50 flights across the Atlantic and I don't think I will make 100. <laughs> yeah, thank you, for your, uh, thank you for all those nice words. I like this, go on, yeah. Now, and now comes the really tough question. You softened me up and now, eh. <laughs> And now my question, uh, I put it just in plain English. I am vexed and thoroughly puzzled by what's going on around this Brexit in your adopted home country. Okay. In plain English, what do you think are the real driving forces, the root cause? Not the people who were told they have Korea in Spain mm -hmm. and not this and that and not Boris Johnson saying we save 350 million pounds each year not paying into the European Union budget we put into the NHS. What is really behind that at the molecular level? Your, your the, personal opinion. The, the molecular level. So listen, so the campaign, I think, so I think it, the, camp, the actual Brexit campaign shows a lot of the trends that we see across the world. But of course, it's much deeper than that. Um, this is part of Britain's 500-year-old schizophrenic attitude and relationship with Europe. Britain's, or England, let's say, put it that way, has always defined itself, its identity is not European. Everybody has exceptionalism. The Danes, the Dutch, the Dutch are terrible. But, um, <laughs> but the English exceptionalism is we're not European. That's a very specific one. Uh, Holland, you can be exceptionalist, but also European. They, they're not exclusionary. Well, in the English exceptionalist, exceptionalism is, is built about not being European. Okay, and here's my personal take, which nobody agrees with me. Um, when, you know, when there was this really massive immigration from the EU. It, it is the biggest immigration since Viking times. It's like four million people arrived in 10 years. It, it is genuinely huge. When all these people arrived from the EU, Latvians, Poles, the English looked at them and realized they were exactly the same as them. Before that, immigration into England had been from the former colonies and there'd been lots of tension, but it always reminded the English that they'd had a great empire. 
You know, the difference actually helped the English feel important and special. And they looked at these Latvians, and they're white, they're into football, they're kind of atheist, they sell dirty jokes, <laughs> they look the same, and the English had a collective nervous breakdown. They're like, what do you mean we're not different? Our whole idea of, is, is that we're different to them. And, and Brexit was kind of a reaction to that. Just, Brexit was a chance to express that for enough people. When I tell this to English people, they don't, they don't, they don't agree. So, so that's my, I'm kind of a half foreigner. And as you, re, as you can tell from the book, uh, like my parents are, are sort of Russian-Ukrainian. So, so I'm, I'm a, uh, not really English, even though I'm a kind of a spy in England, cultural spy. Not a spy that loud, a cultural <laughs> spy. It, it was a metaphor. Um, <laughs> Shit, I better call my handler. I've just completely really revealed myself. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, but, but that's just my sense of it. And, and I, it's actually not in the book, because I wanted the book to be universal, but I do write about it in a very big grant essay called Pop-Up People, uh, where I go into that in a lot more depth. Because I, I covered the, one of the last elections in Britain, and I kind of saw that come through several times. Um, so that's, that's my personal theory. But so it's got to do with that. It's about English exceptionalism and relation to, to Europe, which, look, that goes back to Henry VIII, uh, or maybe Henry V. Um, so the, it's, it's, it's the new iteration of a very old story. Oh, yeah, left. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for sharing about your book today. Do you think that grassroots and anti-lobby political organizations in the U.S., will ever have the resources to combat the efforts of political entities with greater informational resources? What are the small steps that could be taken in the short term? I work in marketing at a huge data firm. Um, I feel like the resources that we have mm -hmm. compared to the resources that people need and should have in terms of inciting um, revolutionary information is very compromised. Um, well, here, here you're, you're into the... So look, there was a great moment of hope, wasn't there, at the start? I, mean, I don't know enough about the situation in, in the US, and I think some of it is very US-specific. Um, and you'd have to tell me. I'm, I'm just not enough of, a, of an expert on, on the specifics of lobbying in, in DC. Um, but obviously, when the internet appeared, it was this massive moment of hope uh, for activists all over the world. And one of the guys I talked to in the book is called Alberto Scorsia, who's kind of a, a leader of protest movements in, in, in Mexico. Um, and, and he goes deeper than just kind of organizing. He, he's a bit of a, he's a guy who kind of lives in data. He sees everything through data. Um, and, and, and what he tried to do is, you know the way Google looked, could spot flu epidemics developing by the way people were searching for certain things and stop the flu ep epidemic? He did the same thing with kind of demands for revolutionary change in Mexico. He, could, he had a methodology of looking at Google searches and geography. You know, there's lots of things that he was looking at which could tell what people's latent desires were. And then he'd start protest movements tapping into all those things. So it's almost as if the internet would let him read the kind of like the latent revolutionary reality. Now I'm speaking in Mexican, kind of Mexican language. Latent revolutionary reality beneath the surface of, of, of what we see. Um, that's kind of his language. Um, and then when the government realized this, they started getting into the troll farms and, and the bots are ways of kind of to come between people and the desires that the data might, re the kind of the social change desires that data can reveal. Um, so that's a fascinating, a fascinating competition. Um, what I liked about him was that he was ready to kind of like really embrace the possibilities of what social media gave you. Again, doing it very openly and transparently. So that's kind of the battle that we're in. Um, I think now we understand that battle. We understand what the dynamics of the battle are, um, and we can think about we can think about fighting it. Um, but I think that's where the new challenge is. So um, he hadn't lost all hope. Um, Looking at the Mexican election, he thought the current Mexican government had won, which is kind of a, a lefty government, kind of lefty that's done a deal with big business, sort of Mexican lefty, um, uh, had managed to, ro to really capitalize on the, on the protest movements. The protest movements hadn't won themselves, but they'd, they'd caused enough movement for a government, to, for a political movement to go, okay, we'll co-op these ideas. He was now worried that those ideas would then be abused, 
but there had been progress. So he'd managed to do something. But this endless game of cat and mouse with the regime's bots and trolls. Uh, and, and it is a war, in the way he described, between kind of reality and, and simulation. Um, so now we've couched it in this kind of like matrix-like terms. Um, but it's going to be a battle. Um, but, but I think they're scared. They're even scared in China and Russia. So they're much more scared than when they, uh, you know, when they owned all the media. So I, I don't think we can just like wimp out going, oh, we don't have enough data. Um, but yeah, so, so I'd, I'd, I'd stay positive. Because uh, there are small victories in the great avalanche of defeats. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you for a, a very stimulating Ramble. hour, hour, whatever it was. Um, a lot of, uh, I'm almost like, you know, my brain has been uh, in, confronted by too much stuff, uh, for sure. But uh, I was thinking a few, well, actually, I tried to grasp onto a few. One was uh, your <laughs> idea of, you made a statement about co-optation. By the way, I'm wondering if your whole talk is like, um, you know, a big postmodern rift. I mean, riff, riff. <laughs> Maybe rift also. <laughs> a, a big riff on, Question, you know, please. you mentioned, oh, okay, fair. Sorry, sorry. Yours yeah. was. <laughs> um, I just thought maybe uh, you would comment on well, a couple, very recently, Robert Reich was here just the other night in town hall, and he said that probably the best thing we can do now uh, is to hope for maybe a general strike in the U.S. that will, you know, because of, because of the sense of helplessness. Okay, excuse me? We're out of time. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. So my question is, could you speak about what's happened in Hong Kong and, and the idea of, I mean, I really feel the need for a materialist basis to some of what you're talking mm. about. And I'd love, I'd love to talk to you later. I'm sorry that the time. Yeah. So, so, so that's, so the Hong, so, so exactly, as we speak here, in talking about hope, yeah, as we speak, there are epic protest, democratic pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong, actually bizarrely a successful series of protests in Russia, in Moscow. Um, protests in Belgrade, in Belisi. Um, the difference between then and let's say 1989 or the Arab Spring is that then there was a sense that all these protests were actually part of a much, much larger story. And now they seem disparate and broken up. What I would want to do now, if I had the resources, if only I ran a think tank at a university, would be to dive very deeply doing sort of like qualitative and data research into all these protests and trying to find what do they have in common. Because I think the old language of pro-democracy movements, freedom of expression, rights, that's all been either co-opted or trashed or just left empty somehow. Yeah? Um, we need to go back to the ground and work out why on earth kind of liberal democracy, because that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about, mattered so much. Because yeah? you know, it, it mattered in a burning way in the 70s and 80s uh, to people across the world. And I think if we dig very deeply into those movements, we'll actually find these interesting commonalities. Because at the moment, they don't feel part of a greater story. They don't feel part of an arc of history. They feel like disparate movements. Uh, and I think, the re I, think the true I think it's there. I just think we have to start looking for it. And maybe, maybe we have to move away from some of the kind of the old language that, that we used. Um, I mean, it's hilarious. I, I interviewed this guy, this kind of far-right activist, Martin Zellner, uh, head of the Identitarians. And he's completely used as the language of Sergio Popovic, the, the, the Serbian, and of pro-democracy movements. So he says, the El Paso shooter had this in his manifesto as well. I want to get rid of intermarriages because I want to pr protect diversity. No? Yeah. Ethnic diversity, you know. You don't, you don't, I don't want people all, all the same race. Or uh, I, you know, the El Paso shooter in his manifesto compared white people to red Indians. Yeah? Uh, Martin Zellner, who inspired the El Paso shooter's language to a certain extent, um, talks about how he's defending women's rights by, by trying to get rid of all Muslims from Europe. Um, you know, he uses, he loves Sergei Popovich's guidebooks and manuals, how to do pro-democracy movements. Um, he says that we're living in a soft authoritarianism of multiculturalism, and he's inspired by Prague 68, and he's inspired by 1989 to bring on, you know, a white nationalist revolution. So we, it's almost we can't use that language anymore. We can't, it's gone. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, that there, isn't new th there aren't new things to fight for. 
Um, maybe we have to just question why on earth liberal democracy, you know, is worth it, uh, and what's so great about it. Could you comment on your interpretation of the protests in Moscow? Actually, ma'am, I'm going to let this gentleman ask his question, and then we're going to be done. Well, they, 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 they did very well at the election, so they kind of poured in something, which is quite rare in Russia. Okay, so uh, I have a question, uh, not, not about flooding of information from like social media, but actually the opposite. The idea of social media actually preventing information from moving around. So basically, something I've noticed a lot with social media is that it tends to have a very constrained space in which the ideas exist. They tend to be very close to kind of what the current belief structures are. And basically, if you have an idea that takes more than 10 minutes to explain, it can be very difficult to really actually get anyone to glom onto that idea. And it tends to be more about things that are like smaller, easier to think about ideas that tend to be more connected to our society. There's a lot of them, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily deep or useful. So I guess kind of my point, my question is, what do you think kind of we can do as a society in the future to kind of move past this to ideas that may genuinely be able to help us as a society, as opposed to merely the ones that exist close to us and are small and are kind of small iterative changes that exist inside this space of debate. Whereas there, I, I basically, my, yeah, my question is, how can we get out of the fever swamp, I suppose? Nationalize the companies. That's all my <laughs> general strike. Let's have a general strike in Silicon Valley. Um, I certainly would, would give them public oversight. It's, it's funny, I mean, that's one way. I mean, the, 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 there's lots of ways, but let's just talk about the regulatory one at the moment. So the way social media especially has been designed encourages this. You know, it rewards polarization. There's decades of research into group polarization theory that when you're in a, polar, in a, in a closed group, you'll always take the most polarized position in order to kind of like get approval from the group or likes and shares. It feeds narcissism. Uh, this is a system that was designed by people who were living in a culture of reality shows yeah, as they were designing this. Uh, again, we keep on coming back to reality shows. I feel so guilty. Um, I kind of designed the social media as kind of one massive reality shows. Reality shows aren't natural, you know? If you go back to the early Apprentice, in Britain especially, and the early Big Brother, people were helping each other. They were communicating. And producers were like, oh my God, this is gonna flop. And they drove people into conflict, because, you know, as Aristotle knows, that makes for great drama. And then we created, the, you know, we created this cultural norm around behavior, which I think, I think people like Mark Zuckerberg just kind of imbued just sitting in their dorms uh, and then poured that into the way they structured social media, the way it's structured, the cognitive and emotive structures that it encourages are completely perverse. And they always use the excuse, oh, they're just, they're just people being people. You know, YouTube's great excuse for showing you more and more extremist content. It's like, well, that's what people want. No, you've built an algorithm that reflects a very weird and warped idea of desire. And so at one point, either they're gonna, you know, if we really wanna change it, we can do the stuff that I'm doing, you know, at the LSC, which is creating better media, competing. But if we really wanna change it, we have to, you know, go up to our elbows in the, in the, into the gore of the companies and really get them to change this. Um, I think that might happen in Europe. So the new British regulation that's coming in on the internet says this explicitly. If the algorithms are encouraging extremist behavior, they need to be changed. How on earth this will work in practice is just a nightmare, but at least they've put it on the table. Um, so, so hopefully that's really the thing. You know, that's, that's the big game changer. Uh, while we wait for that to happen, then the kind of work we're doing at the LSE, I, I can forward you it, I think is, is, is by far and away the most innovative in the field. <laughs> There's lots of little groups. There's lots of little groups doing little things, but it has to be done at scale, and probably the architecture has to change.